I'm using Reveal.js. I love this platform. Um, this is actually a whole presentation I did last year. As you can see, it's kind of an interesting system that you can go vertical or horizontal. So each one is actually a category. And then um, you do fun little things, such as this one. It's actually an embedded iframe that is a working Google Maps within the presentation. Oh, wow. So you're not going to see a lot of these cool features that reveal JS does for this one. As you can see, this one is very bare bones. There's a reason for that, and that is because of uh, their own uh, minimalism. I felt the aesthetics had to fit the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So this is a bare bones reveal JS. Um, now, uh, this one, before I begin, uh, I'm not only doing this presentation today, uh, we, we had a contest. Uh, Tuesday at, at the meetup, and this is now a hostile takeover. Uh, this class is mine as I have demonstrated better knowledge of <laughs> philosophy and religion. Yeah. We, we had a quiz, and both of these, uh, both of these, both of these participated, and both of their teams lost to my team. So this is my class now. Look at me. And I just want you to know that I'm proud that you won. <laughs> So, uh, but for this class, uh, we are talking about naturalism. Now, uh, I kind of had an interesting thing in, we'll get to it on how Thoreau is actually a naturalist, but also not a naturalist. Because philosophically speaking, naturalism is a very broad, broad topic, but kind of one that is not used a lot. Nobody really calls themselves a naturalist. Uh, even if they would be called a naturalist, which is why I also said it's the most uselessly useful qualifier. Uh, and we'll actually see what that means as we continue on. So, the overview for this one, we'll go over the wide uh, philosophical definition, which is highly contested, but is there's a general notion that most people tend to agree on. Uh, we'll touch upon Henry David Thoreau and see how he fits within naturalism and also not naturalism um, will segue that into environmental philosophy, which is, uh, I believe, closer to what Thoreau was talking about in Walden. And then we'll talk about the effects of naturalism. Okay. Um, so to begin with, uh, let's get a broad understanding of naturalism. And there's generally three defined things. So first off, reality, knowledge, and ethics are only explained by natural law and forces. Now with that, it emphasizes empiricism, avoiding a priori ontological and epistemological explanations, and then avoiding supernatural claims. And it's that last point that gives naturalism its biggest definition. Because there's a lot of things that are empirical, there are a lot of things that tend to avoid a priori explanations or beforehand explanations for things, but it's generally naturalism is the avoidance of supernatural explanations. Now, given that, uh, to begin, to begin kind of a, a quick survey to see how uselessly useful this definition is, using just these points, who would consider themselves to be a naturalist? So we have two hands there. Now, here's where it gets fun, because here's what naturalism doesn't exclude. Theology. Now, this is one that uh, is kind of in, uh, unintuitive at first, uh, but theology doesn't require supernatural explanations. Specifically, uh, when it comes to discussions of the Christian God, one of the two main, or, or the main idea, the, the concept, the, what is it, not principle, property, the property of God that people tend to agree on is that he is essentially either eternal or timeless. Now, whether or not it's a natural explanation is actually depending on which one. If one believes God is eternal, that means that God is outside of time. They're outside of space. They're outside of the universe, and they sort of exist in all periods of time. Uh, if God is timeless, though, God is actually within time. He operates as a 
construct of the universe, both creating it, the, the original cause, but also beholden to the natural laws of time. So there are natural explanations for theology. It does not exclude God, but it depends on how people uh, define God, and this is true for all religions. Um, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism all have actually different sects in which they argue about whether or not God is outside or inside the universe. Uh, naturalism also doesn't exclude the mind-body separation. So generally, dualism, uh, which is that the body and the, either the soul or the mind are actually separate entities, uh, most people tend to believe that if there's nothing supernatural, you can't have mind-body uh, separation, except we've seen over the last, uh, I think it's 30 years or so, there's been a resurgence of mind-to-body separation as an explanation, specifically when it comes to um, explanations of quantum mechanics, the idea that the mind is something more than the physical body because something quantumly weird is happening uh, within the brain that gives it some externality. Uh, it also doesn't exclude a priori ethics. So while we said that ontology and epistemology might avoid a priori explanations, uh, there are plenty of people who believe that ethics can still come from an a priori source. And this is dependent on actually the first two. Typically, in that if people believe in moral realism, they believe that the moral realism is subject to natural law itself. And usually, um, the quickest explanation for that is God is subject to natural law, even if he controls it all. He is the source of all morality, therefore there is an a priori ethics. There is a moral realness that we can point to that gives us morality. So, um, given that, now who would say that they would generally find themselves to be a naturalist? Yeah, let's see a few more hands. <laughs> so, uh, here's where we actually get into Henry David Thoreau, which was uh, the inspiration for this one on Canvas, um, and why I say he's a naturalist who's not a naturalist. Um, because we're getting into the weird definitions of naturalism, in that people tend to use it in two different ways. Now, specifically, Thoreau was a student of transcendentalism, and actually he was one of the founding members of the movement of transcendentalism alongside Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, this was essentially the first, a lot of people tend to call it the first philosophical renaissance of American philosophy. It was the first one that really started uh, from American soil and it gave American identity to philosophy outside of just kind of copying what was said in Europe. Um, now, the big elements of transcendentalism came from various, uh, it came from a particular religious movement, um, and that's a whole history by itself. But somewhere along the way, um, the general idea became that organized religion was poisonous to the soul, that organized religion was misleading. And some would even go as far as to say that the Bible itself was actually uh, not a good way to develop spirituality. Specifically, the Bible is a handful of stories, and they would argue those stories could be made by men. They could be misinterpreted by men. They could be mistranslated by men. The Bible is a product of man. And so the only way to connect with God is through personal revelation, personal spiritual experience. It very much leaned into the um, personal relationship with God. And that element specifically is the first element where um, Thoreau actually moves away from a naturalistic explanation because he is still arguing that there is something supernatural, that there is something above reality that one can transcend into. Now, part of that is strong individualism. To have a personal relationship with God, um, Thoreau very much said that one had to essentially separate themselves from uh, societal groups, including organized religion, um, politics, to a lesser extent, although they were they were actually involved in like, anti-slavery movements, but mostly through writing. Um, for the most part, uh, Thoreau, Walderson, or Emerson, um, they, uh, they generally argued that people should sequester themselves and have a strong internal sense that is separate from the society around them. Uh, and then the third part, and this one is 
uh, mostly uh, Thoreau, not as much as contemporaries, but uh, there was a regular theme, a regular pattern of uh, minimalist life, reducing the amount of objects you have around it in economy in Walden. He talks very much about how we define shelter, how we define clothing, and how we've kind of gotten used to this, oh yeah, the expected house is supposed to have two bedrooms and a bathroom, but then he examines other people who live in more minimalist, uh, minimalist dwellings and yet seem to be more happy. That shelter, clothing, um, having to wear the newest fashion, having to fit into um, societal norms, is the thing that's holding you back from your own personal revelation and connection with nature. And this is where we can say that he is a naturalist, because naturalism can be that there is nothing supernatural. Naturalism is also ten, it tends to be used to say that somebody focuses on the environment, on nature, and on man's relationship with it. Um, that's just sort of a confusing portion of the language crisscrossing with itself. Of course, then you, you might actually think, oh, would that make him a naturist? Don't, don't look up naturist. That's, that's the nudist movement, okay? <laughs> like, that's, that's the actual philosophical movement behind nudism is naturism. So it's not naturalism. They sound very similar. They are very, very different. Okay, so with that, we can actually say that um, I'm not Walden, Thoreau. Um, <laughs> The names all jumble up at one point or another. Um, Thoreau it is kind of an early example of environmental, uh, an environmental philosopher. Um, now, environmental philosophy was not really considered to be a thing until roughly the 1950s, and it especially caught on in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, but we can absolutely look back and see that there were people who sort of had the, the foundational aspects that we tend to assume within environmental philosophy today, um, which posits essentially two main points. There's understanding nature, um, which is actually a lot more difficult, uh, but we'll get to that. And then understanding our role within or alongside nature. And I say within or alongside because how one defines a human within the environment is actually kind of everywhere. Either humans are part of the environment and they have a role within that, or humans have extra responsibility, um, are somehow uh, discreet from the natural environment, and therefore are not really considered to be part of it, even if they're alongside it. Um, now the major points of inquiry, uh, because environmental philosophy is a massive field, I'm mostly just going to bring up some of the questions that tend to get asked. First, what is the environment? the ontological basis, which sounds easy. It's the nature in which we live in, except uh, one of the things we've actually been coming across recently is do you consider the moon to be part of the environment? As we're getting to the point where we're actually discussing what if we put people on the moon? What if we put settlements on the moon? Well, do we have any environmental concerns about doing that? Are we going to mess up the moon? Can you mess up the moon? Is the moon even considered part of the environment? Or satellites, us throwing things into orbit, and then uh, over the decades there's kind of an accumulation of satellites and such that just go out of, uh, go out of commission, go defunct. You're just kind of sitting there, and then now people are starting to ask, are we producing space junk? Is that part of the environment we have to care about? And so the question, what is the environment, is highly contested today for the that reason, what the environment is, is kind of hard to define. Um, and then as I said, are humans part of that environment or are we separate from that environment? Again, um, you can actually kind of see it in this room here. We can look out and there's like the natural environment right there. We're here in an artificial cave. We, we can manipulate our environment to such a way that we have this entire structure of steel, and plaster, and carpeting. We don't really second guess it, but that's something that the rest of nature just cannot do. And because we have that power, some people tend to say that humans are above the rest of nature. And because of that, some people will argue that we have the right to dominate nature, and some people will argue that actually gives us more responsibility. Uh, specifically, if you talk to vegans, the idea that um, 
humans are more intelligent than animals gives us more responsibility when it comes to um, farming, when it comes to uh, extracting materials, that sort of thing. Um, do humans have a responsibility to the environment and is it unique? Again, kind of moving into that, but um, depending on how you view humans as either part and parcel, part of nature, we're just kind of the, the latest and greatest animal that kind of took over all the rest, um, or something alongside it, that doesn't define what our responsibility is. Where you see humans doesn't really tell us what we're supposed to do. It just gives you a starting point to ask that question. Now, with that, um, we can move into the effects of naturalism. Uh, and after that explanation, I'm going to ask a VM, uh, raise a hand, who consider themselves to be a naturalist. Wait, right now? Yeah. Yeah, like, it, you can see it's kind of gone up and down, it's all over the place. The more you introduce about the, the definition of naturalism, it's really kind of weird, which is why I say it's the most uselessly useful qualifier. It's useful in that it gives us a wide berth of fields to understand, but if you were to say, like, are you a naturalist? Yeah, most people are going to look at that like, what? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. There's, there's far more, uh, there's far more succinct, far better definitions that people tend to refer to themselves as, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to, like, what do you view as reality? Mm -hmm. um, now, the effects of naturalism, I put here this famous line, plus le champ, uh, plus uh, c'est plus la même chose. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Now, it's essentially um, one of the reasons that if you actually go to the Stanford philosophy wiki for naturalism, the first paragraph is basically them saying, no one uses this word. Everyone basically nowadays is a naturalist. Um, everyone seems to use naturalist argumentation. Everyone's, uh, and nobody's really making a big push for non-naturalist uh, arguments. So, if we can look at what's happening and, and, well, many of the discussions that are happening, and they all seem to be falling into naturalism, that should change things, right? Well, not really. So, this year, uh, I have a page where somebody did an actual survey study on various argumentations for uh, God, uh, broke it down by gender and such, and we can see here, this one's the important one that I want to pull up. arguments in favor of God, according to their popularity among theists, atheists, and agnostics. I'm so sorry, can you get this a little bit bigger? A little bit bigger. Uh, okay. 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 okay, so now it's kind of cutting off the, the oh. end there. <laughs> so I'm gonna Dang it, Zach. considered to be the, the, um, the supernatural arguments. And we can see that they are the least popular these days. Meanwhile, the argument from design and the cosmological argument, both arguments that try to use naturalistic explanations for the universe, how it works, where it came from, and then says, well, there's got to be something that made it. The Big Bang happened, but why did the Big Bang happen? And then one of those explanations is generally God. Um, so, we, we can see that what has generally changed is, theologically, there's still a lot of people who believe, like, religious-wise. Now, we have shown in the uh, atheism talk, religious belief has gone down in the United States and the United Kingdom, but worldwide it's actually gone up. There's more people who believe nowadays than ever, and a big portion of that is because there is kind of this change from, you just have to believe in God, to, no, 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 wait, we have explanations for God. The universe is weird, and there's ways to understand it. So, moving to naturalism doesn't seem to impact theology. 
at all. And then the next thing, these were actually web pages, web pages I tried to load in, but they wouldn't let me because uh, I, uh, websites can do iframe blocking, which is all sorts of fun. But here's a few headlines, and I can pull up any of the charts within them. But we can actually see all of these beliefs are growing. Uh, the last one there, religious uh, Americans less likely to believe intelligent life, that's part of a correlative uh, explanation, uh, demonstration, demonstration, where um, people who tend to hold religious beliefs generally don't look towards extra, extraterrestrial life. But uh, belief in extraterrestrials, and specifically UFOs, and that they're visiting this planet, uh, that has increased over the last two decades. And that would make sense, that's a purely naturalistic explanation, if our planet made life, and those are just natural processes. There's how many planets out there? I actually one time did lowball estimation, it was something like 10 to the, 10 to the power of like 27 stars out there that would probably have life. Like that eliminated all the ones that wouldn't have life just on the like lowest amount of estimation I could come up with. So like life being out there is just sort of like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that just kind of makes sense. Um, and then people just sort of go, well, if it's out there and there's these weird things that people see in the sky, obviously that's gotta be connected. <laughs> So it's, it's a purely naturalistic thought, but it's, it's one that a lot of people have been sort of uh, saying has become dangerous. We can see the, the raid Area 51 thing that was massive, that did just come out of nowhere, that came from a legitimate place where the small group of people actually thought that Area 51 contains aliens. And then it just it escaped out into the internet and then it became a joke. But we're lucky that it became a joke because if it didn't, I actually wonder if there were gonna be a dozen people that just sort of show up with rifles and try to actually take out Area 51. That, that was a possible future we had on that day. Um, so generally, uh, it's, it's also the same with like ghosts, new age beliefs. Uh, more people believe in psychics nowadays. Um, and before when psychics would say, oh, I'm, I'm accessing another world, they would usually be talking about an afterlife some supernatural existence beyond our reality. Now, the actual explanation they give, which is all sorts of interesting, is they say, I'm accessing another universe. They're moving on to the naturalistic multiverse explanation. Like, well, if our universe, maybe our universe isn't unique, maybe there's a whole multiverse out there. Uh, that could explain why the Big Bang happened. Uh, and then psychics take that and they go, wait, I could just say that. I'm not accessing another reality in some distant, multiverse, and it will make sense to people who uh, are moving away from theology. So moving towards naturalism doesn't necess uh, necessitate um, that we are actually moving towards uh, towards rational thought, in my opinion. I, I will heavily state, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. I know there, I, I have plenty of friends who will tell me that they believe in ghosts and I will lock them all I want, but I can't force them not to believe. That's their business. Um, and in summation, you know, the rise of naturalism is neither positive nor negative. It doesn't seem to change belief, but it seems to change our understanding of how to explain our beliefs. It's a refocusing of our place uh, within a natural universe, and we're simply reforming old beliefs and creating new beliefs to better the natural explanation. And that is it. Okay. Good job. Any questions for Austin? No. Do you know who would have coined the term of environmentalism or environmental philosophy? Um, environmental philosophy, like I said, like it, that was a, I can't remember who coined it, but it was the, the 1950s. Um, Might be if, yeah, I, I don't know too much about the field or anybody within it. I just know that it's, um, prior to that, it was just sort of nature existed and man was in it, and it, that was just kind of accepted. And then once we started developing the idea of like, oh, we can actually impact, uh, a big part of that was the uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas, which started in the 1950s. That's when we 
we start to understand, oh, <laughs> we're doing something here, and it's kind of affecting on a large term scale. That's when environmental philosophy started to become defined. So a commentary I wanted to add to this track. Uh, for the most part, I believe I did a pretty good job of tackling the, the overall discussion. However, there was a portion there where I did want to explain that um, the history of philosophy did have kind of this overall problem of um, the difference between supernatural explanations and naturalism. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to that within the talk. I was told I had a 15 minute timeline. Um, obviously, I went over that, but um, it is what it is. Um, it, also, I do have to say the department head was there. So I had an additional pressure in that I was not only performing for a class of my fellow students or my teacher, it was for the department head. And uh, I have done presentations with uh, the department head there prior. Um, this is not the first time I've, I've presented in the same room as the department head or with contemporaries of the, the department head. So it... it and I do apologize for, for like kind of stumbling over words, not only in the speech, uh, but as well as here, there are just certain words I generally have a problem with. Um, it, it, overall though, I will say that uh, I believe I did a good job, but the, the one aspect of naturalism that I, I feel like I didn't get, um, that I didn't get fully into was, this kind of idea that um, there's uh, it, the start of it was Plato and Aristotle. Um, Plato and Aristotle were both philosophers that um, generally came from the same era. Uh, Plato, though, it, with his explanation of the forms, very much came from the sort of place that um, there is something greater than reality. Um, there's the forms within physical reality and then there's the essence of the forms and the essence of the forms comes from something higher than reality itself and this is essentially the basis for many of the supernatural claims that come uh past greek philosophy anything outside of greek philosophy that generally talks about something higher than reality is usually usually it's it's not always but usually harping on something that plato said um outside of that aristotle basically took the forms that uh plato was talking about and said look i have no reason to believe that the higher forms exist the only ones i can observe are the ones directly in front of me and so that's what i'm gonna use in order to be able to explain physics and metaphysics and whatnot so it's this this whole divide between naturalistic explanations i i it it, it really does feel like i um i kind of lambasted supernatural explanations and i don't want that to be i don't want that to be taken away from this lecture uh for the most part it like the vast majority of the history of uh, philosophy has been about the discussion between um, how much can we really trust nature and it really isn't un until the last two centuries that uh, we've really started to move into a naturalistic explanation um, and I, I just wanted to add that note this is a fairly new phenomena that uh, phenomenon that we have really started to just see the universe as as purely naturalistic now it is um if you ask most people yes nowadays it is a purely naturalistic universe even it it, it doesn't even really depend on who it is like um for for the most part if, if you ask uh most people is it's going to be um it, it's going to be a naturalistic explanation but that's it, that's not even <laughs> That's not even important. The, it, the point is, um, the overall point of my lecture, it, w it was to point out that 
even though we actually discuss things nowadays in a fairly naturalistic form, it really hasn't changed anything. Um, even if the vast majority of the history of philosophy and uh, scientific explanation and medicine and uh, it, all sorts of uh, explorations into art aesthetics and whatnot, like, it, 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 independent of, of what we've actually gone into prior to this, um, none of it has really changed. The explanations haven't changed much. Uh, the more things change, the more they say the sa stay the same. Uh, plus la change, uh, plus c'est la, uh, c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's, we might be moving away from a supernaturalistic world, but the thing I tend to argue is that that doesn't mean we're moving towards something that is f uh, more understandable. It, it doesn't mean we're moving towards a world that is actually what we wish to describe. There, uh, we, t we as a species love to go towards explanations that are still uh, just sort of... <laughs> it's... I... But... Uh, I'm, I'm losing with the words, uh, my apologies, but uh, we go for ex simple explanations. That, it, that's a whole topic that uh, someday I'm going to have to uh, tackle. And I, I, I really do think that is something that is worth exploring, but I, I, it, it, it's not for this. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully that, that clears up, like... I'm not trying to just dissuade the, the history of philosophy overall, but it's more that I'm, I'm trying to, ex I, I'm, I'm trying to really hit it nowadays, um, in how we, how we interpret it, uh, uh, within sort of a, uh, now in 2023, I guess that's the best way to put it, um, Hopefully, hopefully that helps.